Good afternoon. Nice to see you all here. We are most fortunate to have another speaker in our series, and not just any speaker, but our very own Dean of Math and Science. We'll start out at the beginning here, what is science? When you hear the word science, many people think, oh, it's a class I have. It's one of the requirements for my general education degree. But really, it's a way of knowing, a way of learning things. It's a way of going about learning about the world. And one of the things you can do to really, as a mental exercise, see how important it is in the world we live in is to kind of work through a couple of things that I'm going to uh, to take you into here in just a minute, uh, to, to stop and think about how much is woven into our society. It's difficult. It is in so many things. It makes an impact in your life in so many ways that you may have, a, it may be hard for you to understand or believe there was a time we didn't have uh, the scientific method and the things that, that it gives us. And there was a time before there was science. There are a lot of you, in fact, statistically more than half of you would not be here. You would not have survived to be here had it not been for things that science has delivered. And things, by the way, that have only been brought about, in many cases, in the last uh, 100 years or so. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands because it's a personal thing, but I know that statistically in here, a number of you uh, were probably born in a difficult birth, had some circumstance that required intervention, perhaps a cesarean section or something else, were born uh, as a um, premature infant. Your chances of survival uh, in times past would have been somewhere between zero and none. Okay. Many of you had childhood diseases or other things that were cured with antibiotics and things that we have today. And more importantly, most of the younger of you never had some of the diseases the older of us suffered through. And you know, a fair number of people, by the way, did not survive those diseases or actually suffered permanent uh, impairment from them. A far greater number than have ever suffered any harm from the vaccinations and the signs of the evidence backs that up. That's not a feeling I have. That's something that statistics show. And it goes on and on because keep in mind that your parents also had to have survived for you to be born and your grandparents and so on and so forth. We wouldn't have a population of more than 7,000 million people in this world, right? 7 billion, 1,000 million, without the of science. For a long time, our struggle was just surviving. So here's a thought experiment for you to go through. Think about this. What are the advances? If you were to go back and imagine the world in the past, go back to a time 2,000 years ago, thousand years ago, five hundred years ago, a hundred years ago. In each of those time periods, think about what the world was like. How people got around, what the state of medicine was, what the state of agriculture was. Do you think there was a lot of change between two thousand years ago and a thousand years ago? Is there a whole lot of change in that period of time? The way people got around? Yeah. How so? Well, not just Oh, no, no, no. I'm not, I don't mean different from today. I mean different from those from 2,000 to 1,000 years ago. So if you went back to the uh, to the Christian era and then turned back the, the hands of time to to a thousand years after that, around the year you know 1100 or so, riding horses, right? Had some cars, wagons, so on and so forth. Like we'd actually gone backwards. One of the things you've got to remember is that we think because your experience in your lifetime and the experience in the last couple of centuries has been forward marching. That's how it works. Oh no, we've gone backwards. How many of you realize the Romans knew how to make concrete? You know that? Anybody been to Rome? You've been to Rome. Here's your trivia question. Those humanities people don't need not answer. What's the real name of the Colosseum? You know, it has like a dedication plate on it. Yeah, it's called the Flavian Amphitheater, and it was made out of concrete and bricks. Oh, okay, great. Well, we built stadiums out of concrete today. Oh, the only thing is that between the time that Rome collapsed, the, the late 400s or thereabouts, until the early 20th century, we'd forgotten the recipe for cement or for concrete. It was lost. It had to be reinvented. Sometimes the clock runs backwards. 
So from 2,000 years ago to 1,000 years ago, there wasn't much change. There wasn't much change in medicine. There wasn't much change in understanding the world. 500 years ago, ah, now things are starting to click. The beginning of the age of exploration, led by the Portuguese. So 500 years ago, things are starting to move. And no coincidence, we're at the beginning of the, 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 the dawn of, of what becomes the scientific era, the earliest stirrings of that. Now, between 500 years ago and 100 years ago, things have really made a lot of changes. 100 years ago, without cars, they had cars. And uh, in, in, in 100 years ago, in Tampa? What do you think? What would 100 years ago be? 1919? Yeah, they had cars. Burma Chevrolet's been around since 1898. They had cars in Tampa. Any airplanes in Tampa in 1919? Yeah, they had airplanes. One of the places that they flew out of was not far from here. Later they had Drew Field, that's where this campus is. But at that time they were flying out of a place closer to where the uh, armory is, which is now the uh, Jewish Community Center uh, over on uh, Howard. You guys know where that is? Yeah. They flew airplanes out of it. Yeah. Not airplanes like we have today. Primitive and rickety. Cars weren't quite like we have today. They had cars, they had airplanes, they had the beginnings of medicine. You had a reasonably ch good chance of surviving surgery in 1919. Things have really made a lot of change in that time period from 500 years ago to 100 years ago. From 100 years ago to 50 years ago, well, then things have changed even more. 50 years ago, 1969. Yeah. What, do you, what can you infer about the nature of progress in the time? How would you describe it in mathematical terms? Exponential. Exponential, particularly after about 500 years ago. It, it had really taken off. Now, those are two of the most famous pictures in aviation. You guys know the one on the left? That picture was taken at Kilbevel Hill at Kitty Hawk, and that was the right one of his first flight. What's so interesting about that picture, because you guys are used to snapping pictures, you know, and there they are right there and there. Ooh, I better delete that one. In those days, they would take a picture and have to develop it. And depending on whether or not they had the capability at the location or not, it might be weeks or even longer before they develop a picture. That picture was taken by a Coast Guardsman who was helping the Wright brothers because they were a little busy, you know, learning to fly. And they asked him, did you get it? Did you get it? And he was so excited. In the moment, he goes, yeah, I think so, because the shutter was tripped. So there was this like long period where they kind of like, oh, because you know what? Whether it's back then or now, they don't picture it didn't happen, right? He got it. One of the most famous pictures in aviation. Oh, maybe the first picture in power flight of aviation. How about the second picture over here? Sea of Tranquility, 1969. Some of us remember that because we got to stay up late. Then kids go to bed early back then. So when I was able to stay up late and watch the first man out on the moon, I thought it was pretty cool. 1969. Anybody know when the Wright brothers flew? That'll answer that question for you. You can do simple head math. Say again. A little bit earlier. 1903. All right? So 1903, 1969, how long is that in between those two pictures? Yeah, there's not that many. They're not answering. I want to see their students can. 66 years. Yeah, 66 years. And we landed on the moon 50 years ago this coming summer. That means only 13 years less since we landed on the moon than separating those pictures. That again makes, makes this the, the point about progress, doesn't it? We went from a plane that flew 120 feet under its own power to flying all the way to the moon a quarter of a million miles away in 66 years. The term science comes from the Latin word scientia means to know. So when we talk about science in the most literal sense, we're talking really the name uh, for that subject you think of uh, is really the name for the process that that subject is based on. So it's how we know things. For most of human history, uh, the world was a uh, pretty, uh, pretty cruel place. People lived in ignorance, things that you know today and take for granted. They didn't know about. It was mysterious, but never do people not have an explanation for things. Think about that. 
Before you knew the things you know now, you had some answer for things. We don't have an answer, we'll make one up. Problem is, once we make one up, we may not be willing to give it up. And so, when you have answers that are just made up, sometimes you get lucky. Sometimes they turn out to be pretty close to the answer you've determined through a scientific process. Other times, they were way off. They, they weren't even close. So what's the harm in that? Well, let's take a look and see. So try to understand the world before we understand microorganisms. What? Let's, <laughs> but we know about germs now, don't we? If you didn't know about germs, how would you know about germs? You can't see them. People say, I don't believe what I can't see. Really? You don't believe in germs? We know about germs. We know that about germs now. What would you think in the past people thought was the reason that sickness came? Evil spirits? Bad air. If I lived next to a stinking swamp, it could make me sick. I might even name the disease after it. If I lived near a stinking swamp, mal area might be a malady I would suffer. We know the real reason is mosquitoes. mosquitoes. So science makes explanations, but the other thing it does is it offers predictions. Because if you understand the concepts, then you can, you can make predictions. And, and that's where it really starts to have tremendous power. Because once you understand how things work at a fundamental level, you can understand maybe how that could go a different direction. Not just explain this particular phenomenon, but be able to use that knowledge to come up with new things nobody ever dreamed before. That's why you go from 2,000 years ago to 1,000 years ago, and nothing much has changed. And then 500 years ago, they're starting to learn the basics of science, and things start to speed up. Science not only makes these predictions, it allows us to compound knowledge, but it also is self-correcting. So this is an important point, a really important point. It's self-correcting. Does science make mistakes? Tries not to, but it certainly does. Why? Who are the people that are doing science? People. People make mistakes. Sometimes the mistakes are truly mistakes and they're unintentional. And other times it could be that people involved in science have actually done something they probably shouldn't have done, gone beyond their data. Sometimes it could actually be fraud. The beauty of science is it will find those people out. It will find those mistakes. It will out them. It will fix those things. It doesn't hold anything sacred. For a long time we thought Isaac Newton was a genius, well, we still did, as he was. We thought his work was unassailable. No, actually we didn't, because in science we always put things to the test. And for a long time, Newton's ideas about gravity worked. And they worked really, really, really well. But they didn't work perfectly. There were a couple of little teeny tiny things that they didn't quite work for. But those were really inconsequential. In fact, it took a long time for us to even realize that Newton's ideas about gravity had a tiny, teeny, small bug in them. But that was a hint. That was a hint that maybe, well, maybe there was something better. And that better came along with the work of Einstein. And we took Newton's work, and which, well, by the way, we still use for many calculations because it works fairly well for most things. But we took Newton's work and kicked it to the curb. Hey, he's a genius. We love him. But his work's been replaced by something that works better. That's how science works. If we don't put it up on the shelf and never change it, it doesn't become revered. It doesn't become dogma. All right, I like this. It says science, if you don't make mistakes, you're doing it wrong. If you don't correct those mistakes, you're doing it really wrong. If you can't accept that you're mistaken, you're not doing it at all. There's fallibility in whatever human beings do. Accepting it, being willing to change it and address it, that's the beauty of science. So Albert Einstein, we just mentioned him a moment ago, he said this about science. All of our science measured against reality is primitive and childlike, and yet it's the most precious thing we have. This guy, you guys are used to seeing him in almost a cartoon character fashion. He was a pretty cool guy. He was a young guy. He was a ladies' man. Yeah. Funny guy. Played, played <laughs> violin. He was, he was into, and he had a sense of humor. That's an interesting picture. It's a real one, not Photoshop. They had in those days. He was leaving some event, and he had a by this time, he actually was famous. He was a famous scientist in his own time, for his own accomplishments. 
And as he was leaving, the photographer said, one more picture. Dr. Ron said, please, one more picture. He said, I'll grant you your request, but I get to choose the pose. So that's what he did. Just had some fun with him. How many people know Carl Sagan? Anybody remember Carl Sagan? Carl Sagan was another scientist who was famous in his own time. What's interesting is that a couple of decades ago, and, and even further back, there were a number of scientists who were famous in their own time for the things that they did. If I had to put money on anybody in this room knowing somebody who was a scientist and being able to come up with a name, it would have been nearly rest test. So you didn't disappoint me in that regard. And if you don't know anybody else, that doesn't disappoint me. Well, it does disappoint me. It doesn't surprise me either. You know everything about what the Kardashians are doing. <laughs> Which is what? And, and, and any number of other people who are famous for being famous but never contributed to society. And, I, and I'm not passing a value judgment, but if, if, if they vanished from the earth, aliens abducted them or whatever, other than the story that would be in the, the you know, on the web and so on, the, the world would keep turning and so on. <laughs> Carl Sagan did a lot to popularize science. Interestingly enough, some of his biggest critics were other scientists, which is a real problem. Because in science, there's some people who think, well, if you're a scientist, you shouldn't go out and you know, engage in that sort of thing. You shouldn't be a scientific Kardashian. But we've come to realize that, you know, that's probably one of the big problems. You probably need to get out, tell the story, make people understand why this is important to them, and then maybe there'll be more people getting into it. And uh, the scientific and technical jobs won't be moving overseas. And we'll maintain our preeminence as a scientific nation. I think after his death, many people realized the, 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 the tremendous debt that's owed to Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan wrote a book called A Candle in the Dark, Science as a Candle in the Dark. He said, it's what lights up that dark ignorance that we lived in for 30,000, maybe more, years as fully modern people, even longer into our prehistory before that. And finally, somebody lit the candle in the dark to show us the way. The candles can blow out, just like I told you. History can turn back. The, the, the title of that book not only tells us how important it is to illuminate the darkness, but how, how uh, dangerous it is, too, how quickly it can be extinguished. How do you know you deal with science versus pseudoscience? We're going to talk a little bit about science rejection, science denial, and so on. But there's also another interesting thing. There's people who claim to be using science, or they would make you believe that something is scientific, and maybe it's not, because they recognize that there are some times that people do put stuff in science, and if they can pretend it's science, well, then maybe they'll get somewhere. How do you how do you test to see if something is scientific? Well, first of all, can the hypothesis be put at risk? I'm not even going to ask you this question because they'll make me upset, and I'm having a good day. I'm not going to ask you this question. I'm going to pretend to. Don't answer. Don't say it. Don't say it. Well, what's a hypothesis? Well, here's what they were taught, almost in a responsive reading manner, to say, educated test, right? You wanted to say that, didn't you? No. Some of you did. Who wanted to say it's an educated guess? And anyway. What's an educated guess? It's nonsense. There's a lot of people in this room who are educated, and all the rest of you are on your way to it or already educated to some degree on your way to higher education. Some of us have several degrees. So if we make a guess, is that a hypothesis? Could be if it's informed by information, it's based on things that are reasonable to believe might be, might be the case, or it could just be a guess. So a hypothesis, I like to use the, the definition for a hypothesis, it is, that it is a reasonable explanation. A reasonable explanation that's been informed by uh, past experience, by conceptual understandings that might be incomplete, that you're trying to, trying to move forward. So you come up with this hypothesis. You say, I have a hypothesis about something that I want to do what to? Test it. So if I take and test the hypothesis, if I put it at risk, well, if it doesn't work, well, 
probably wasn't a good explanation. I need to go back and tweak it. And if I keep tweaking it, I can maybe get it to work. And if I get it to work pretty consistently, well, then that's telling me I'm probably on the way to making that hypothesis into a scientific theory. And I had the ability to change this. And I, uh, I've come to realize the older I get, the ability is, I have to change things. But I work within my sphere. I'm doing it right now. If I could change this word out of the English language, I would get rid of the way we use the term uh, theory in science. Or in general conversation, it'd be easier probably to get rid of it in scientific use. Because we use the word theory in general population, in, I mean, in general conversation, in the same way science uses the word hypothesis, right? If you have a theory about something, that plane crashed at Amazon cargo plane. Oh, I got a theory about what may have happened. Well, I am a pilot, and so my theory might be actually a hypothesis that, in the scientific sense of the word, is pretty good, and if it pans out, then it becomes a theory. You follow me on that? But most people, when they use the word theory in general conversation, they're using it in general conversation like scientists would use the word hypothesis. It is sort of a punch, you guess. A shot at something. See, in science, when a hypothesis gets elevated to theory, it's been proven over and over and over and over and over again. We're still willing to change if something better comes along to change from it, just as we did with Newton's work, replaced by Einstein's work. But when you hear about a scientific theory, it's not a guess or a hunch. Well, people think, yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah. It means that thing's held up pretty good. You got something better? Let's see it. Do you see how that gets us in trouble? How people say, well, well the scientists have a theory about this, they have a theory about No, 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 no. If scientists use the word theory, it means something different. If, if people aren't willing to put their hypothesis at risk, it isn't science. If you're not willing to say, here it is, test it out. I believe in it. I want you to see if it holds up. It's not science. Is there a selective use of the facts? The, the, the common term that's cherry picking. Have I only taken facts that support my idea? and ignored those that don't. For instance, let's say I came up with some kind of cure for baldness, a pill you can take, grow all your hair back. Well, if, if some people had their hair come back that were taking the pill, I'm going to include them in my study and say, yes, it works. But the majority of people, the vast majority, probably 99.9%, who didn't, I'm going to ignore them. I'm selectively using facts to support my idea. I'm not looking at the totality of the circumstances. Is the hypothesis supported by criticism of other ideas or personal attacks on people that are offering those ideas, or does it stand on its own? This, then, is one of the things that you see in debate and in politics. So if I'm running against John in a, in, a, in a race, instead of telling you about how great my ideas are, I'm going to say, you know, this guy, have you heard what he wants to do? He's, his ideas are going to bankrupt. He's crazy. Yeah, well, but what am I all about? Never mind. He's the one you got to watch. He's dangerous. <laughs> Yet we fall for that over and over, don't we? We, we fall for that, not just in politics, but in many other things. We listen to the criticisms of something else and really don't look to see what's being offered in support of the idea that's in opposition to it. Now, how about the last one? Overly simplistic explanations for things. If it's that simple, I don't know. Sometimes it's true. Most of the time it's not how often do we fall for that? Again and again and again. Hey, I got this, I got this investment strategy. Do you see these people on TV and on the, the radio? They're talking about, I've got this new uh, program for you to flip houses in the Tampa Bay area. You'll be a millionaire in six weeks. Okay, what's wrong with that? You tell me. Absolutely, because if I knew how to do that, I wouldn't be telling you schmoes. I'd be out there making another million. I wouldn't be here at 4 o'clock on Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> but people never think about that, do they? Man, oh, he's a great guy. He's going to share this idea. No. He's going to take your money. 
tell you something you probably already know, or it's common sense, and wish you well out the door so you get the next bunch of suckers in there. The U.S. has a science problem. And I'm going to tell you about this. Some of you, again, are old enough to remember this. When I was a kid growing up in the 60s, I grew up in the Orlando area, as Margaret alluded to. And many of the fathers of uh, the kids I went to school with worked at, at the Cape. And uh, we didn't quite watch the rockets take off. In fact, the Saturn V rockets that launched the astronauts to the moon, they would cause the patio doors that went out to our uh, patio rattle, just vibrate. If you've been where earthquakes occur, and some of you I know live in Southern California and elsewhere, it, that same kind of thing. I mean, it would shake the ground. And we grew up in that era. That was exciting stuff. It was an amazing time. And people, kids in school, a lot of kids in school wanted to be scientists, wanted to be astronauts, wanted to be engineers. And a lot of them went on to do that. They went on to be college professors. We really believed in, in the power of science. After World War II, there was a belief in this country, and it was well-founded, that science helped us win the war. What was it that ended the war? That's why I'm dropping the bomb back here. The atomic bomb, one of the greatest science projects in terms of the effort and the ability to advance our understanding from the conceptual to the operational in a short period of time. There was this belief. We went into the war with artillery. We ended it with an atomic bomb. Two atomic bombs dropped. We went into the war with mechanical ballistics calculations. We came out with the first computers that were used to calculate ballistics for ballistic trajectories. We went into the war with binoculars and we came out with radar. Primitive radar existed at the very beginning of the war. It was a secret weapon that the English had it helped them win the Battle of Britain. But the advance in technology in World War II was seen as not only the reason we won the war, but the reason that we had this great hope for prosperity after the war. But then something happened. And we're still trying to figure out what happened. It happened sometime, maybe in the late 70s, maybe in the 80s. It was definitely something you could see by the 90s. People became less interested in science. Kids became less interested in science. Uh, our understanding as a nation about things became uh, shallower. Even at the same time as technology was in our lives to a greater degree. He was oh, well, I don't, no, I don't believe that. Oh, we, everybody's got a computer and cell phone. To, how many of you know how they work? How many of you can even explain the principle behind cell phone telephony, how cell phones work when you drive around? Or how many of you know the, 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 the basic principles behind the operation of, of computers? Well, you put a best buy, you get one, you put this cable in, you turn it in. I mean, you use it, but you don't understand it. It might as well be magic. <laughs> In fact, there's a, there's a very famous statement that technology, is made by Isaac Asimov, an author, technology sufficiently advanced beyond either that of your society or perhaps your own personal comprehension level is indistinguishable from magic. The problem then is if it becomes magic like that, then a few wizards control it. I don't like that. I don't want that to be the case. We, we have really turned our back on science in many ways. We also see this in the number of <clears throat> PhDs that are granted and the percentage that are going to foreign students. Oh, we've got a lot of people in college. Hey, thank you. I've, I've relied on it for 30 years for a bit of roof over my head. At this level, fewer people make it to the next level. Fewer people make it still. It's kind of like salmon going up the river. But if you go, especially in scientific and technological areas, and you take a look in grad school and see who's in those classes, it does not look like the demographic complexion of a typical community college, or even state university, or even elite university uh, undergraduate class. Because ooh, math is hard, science is hard. And if you don't have math and science as an undergraduate background, you're not going to get to graduate school. Seats aren't going empty, are they? They're filled by people who are coming from places that still value them. Now, some stay, thankfully, and work for us. Others go back to where they came from and work for wherever it is they came from. 
This is a crisis. This is a real crisis. Because a brain drain like that does not keep a country intellectually strong. We're chasing down a lot of, quote, crises. This is one of the concern. This is really evidenced by the fact that about half the country's citizens reject the facts of evolution. And this is one of those things where we go, oh, I don't I don't I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't believe that. Well, you can believe what you want, but we got the fossils. And oh, I hate to tell you this, but every one of those lying cells in your body is going to tell the story at a molecular level of the progression of life from a single cell organism, a common ancestor of everybody in this room, to this very day. You're the last link, every one of you, unless you have kids, who's got kids? <clears throat> then you're not the last link. You're the second to the last link, or if you have grandkids, third to the last link, in a chain of life that goes back 4,000 million years. I think that's cool, man. That's a great story. It's real. About half the people in the country do not believe it, will not believe it, do not accept it. What's interesting is that number hasn't changed in about 50 years. By the way, that number is not the same for most of the European countries. Fewer than a third agree there's scientific consensus on human-caused climate change. Got to tell you, folks, that's settled science. Two degree, uh, two uh, <clears throat> standard deviations is, is the degree of, of the accuracy of this data. It's happening. The question is how fast, how much, and what the consequences are. I don't believe really. <laughs> <Great. laughs> If I get into a, quote, hard to use the term of art, this and match with somebody else, like, Ford trucks or Chevy trucks are better. We actually know the Toyota, so I can go and see it. That's a, just a friendly argument, and it's an opinion. Or maybe it could be backed up with evidence. You could pull the service records and say, well, I love it. But when we're talking about things like this, and I hear people who don't have the training in this and haven't invested the time to read the literature to take a look at what the people who do have come up with, and I say, wow, I don't believe this. Or, as bad are the people who are zealots on the other side who would have you believe the world was ending tomorrow but can't tell you what it is they base their belief on. Well, that's a real problem. Because this isn't just a, I'm against it, therefore, yeah, yeah. It's, I'm for it, but I don't know why I'm for it and, and, and how it is I can support my argument. These are problems. We led behind, this is a Pew Research Center poll 2017, 25 other developed countries. By the way, some of them on that list are not really that developed. If you were looking at the list, you'd go, oh no, it's terrible. I mean, people say, oh, Japan, well, you know, they make good cars. Those are other cars. Germany, well, you know, they get the World Wars now again. Sharp people. But this country's not there to just blow you away. Their students and their citizens consistently score better on scientific literacy than we do. That's shameful. Is that a sunrise or a sunset? Well, let me think about it for a while. What's that guy doing over there at Sarah Pisa? Throwing bocce balls out. That may or may not have actually happened. It probably didn't happen. Galileo, at the time he was claimed to have done this, the Tower of Pisa was already old even then. It was a tourist attraction even then. They would let him go up there and throw stuff out for fear it hits him in the head. But there is an apocryphal story that Galileo dropped bocce balls out of the Tower of Pisa to demonstrate a concept that flew in the face of what intuitively was believed since the time of Aristotle. Aristotle said, and I'm not even going to ask if you believe this, but if I got a five pound weight and I got a 10 pound weight, or whatever the unit of measure at his time, and I drop those, well, it's obvious that the heavier one hits the earth fat first, isn't it? Of course, heavy things fall faster. Do you know how many people still believe that? Depending on what group you ask, it is a majority to a rather large minority of the public that believes that, which is shocking because you can do a real easy experiment. I'll, I'll do it with my shoe and this pen. Okay. My shoe obviously weighs more than this pen. If you don't believe it, watch. Here they are, side by side. Ready, set, hey! They hit at the same time. And if I took that up and threw it off the roof, same thing. Now, a hammer and a feather, 
That's different. The feather has more air resistance relative to its mass. But if I took them to the moon, oh, by the way, they did on one of the Apollo flights, they dropped a hammer and a feather, and they hit at the same time. Although they fell at a slower rate. Why? Yeah, instead of accelerating at 9.8 meters per second squared, it was at a lower rate, the moon is one-sixth the gravity of the Earth does. But people believe stuff because it just seems right, and they didn't challenge it. It wasn't until Galileo's time they actually challenged that. Also, a fellow by the name of Lucha Kaberkman, you ever heard of him? <coughs> That's how his name would have been pronounced in his native college. His Latinized name is Nicholas Copernicus. He said, yeah, you know, that, which by the way is a sunset in our hemisphere, that sunset is an illusion. The sun isn't setting. The earth is turning. The sun is more or less fixed from our perspective, and as we turn under it, it looks like it's moving. Do you know there's people to this day that don't accept that? Not many, but a few. Why? It looks so convincing. It looks like it does it. It must be true. If I can't see it, I don't believe it. Except the Germans. So why, why is this the case? Let me address that. At, at an innate, you know what I mean by that? At a, at a, at a fundamental level, we, we don't do well with things that are counterintuitive, with things that don't look like they ought to look based on some feeling we have about how things ought to be. There's also cultural biases that are baked into us from the time we're just so small we don't remember, that control the way we think. Those are really hard to overcome. Now we're also talking about control. We like to have control over things. And even if we don't really have control over things, we want to feel like we do. So we come up with explanations that make us feel like we have control. And a lot of superstitions are just that. You know, good grief, knock on wood, I hope I'm right. Why? I don't know, they gave me some sense. I was reading a story recently about a pilot, a pilot who's going to get in a plane and fly, that plane with people on board, yeah, who would always rub the door frame of the plane for good luck, who on occasion would forget and get out of the seat to go back and rub the door frame before he got back in the pilot seat. Does that scare you? He was a good pilot. I'm not going to ask, but I know a lot of you do stuff like this. Why? Well, I don't want to take the chance. Maybe it doesn't work, but maybe it does. So we look for patterns. Hey, every time I did that, I never crashed. Well, somebody else might have done that too, and then they crashed, and they're dead, and they're not here to say, yeah, it doesn't work. <laughs> you ever thought about that? No. Wrong thinking. Bad ideas. Bad ideas are hard to get rid of. They're hard to get rid of. Sometimes we don't even want to get rid of them because we have to work at getting rid of them. Why we don't want to get rid of them is we might not realize, we might not value, value or realize that any potential is worth the risk. If I have an idea, even if I kind of maybe know it's wrong, but I think there might be a risk, if in the community that I live in, people think that, I don't know, redheads are Trump. <laughs> well, they are. Everybody knows that's true. But I'm using this as a company. Well, I don't want to be the guy saying, oh, no, in actuality, it's just a, uh, you know, a minor change in a couple of genes in people's hair color. But if people believe that, I don't want them to think I'm falling into the redheads, because then they might treat me bad, too. Right? So sometimes we think there's a risk, and maybe we don't say what we truly believe. That's true of religion. I know people who told me that in reality they're probably truly atheist, but they kind of call themselves agnostic because they want to keep open the possibility. Because you never know, it could just possibly be true, and if it is, well, you know, they don't want to spend eternal damnation in hell. To which I say, well. Don't you think an omnipotent creator could look into your heart and mind and say, oh, you're just hedging your bets? <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't even think about that. Oh, by the way, I love that picture. This guy is not having it. That's Galileo. 
who's read it, by the way. This guy's not happy. This guy's going, whoa! Yeah, man, he's on to something. Galileo was the first person to use a telescope to look at things like the moon. And see, the moon looks a lot like the Earth. It's got a rough surface. It's got craters, mountains. It's not a celestial orb that's pure and heavenly. It looks like 90 miles of bumpy road, as my granddaddy used to say. He saw sunspots projecting the image on a car, watched them turn, timed the rotation of the sun. <clears throat> he saw moons going around Jupiter, following the exact same behavior that Kepler had calculated the planets should behave by in accordance with Copernicus's ideas. So that one guy's going, yeah, man, check it out. This guy's going, oh, I'm not even going to look. Because if I look, I might see something that I don't want to see. Because if I don't see it, that's not real, not true. Just like germs, I don't see them. No, I don't see it. <laughs> what scares some people is what I was just alluding to, is that what we may discover, what we may learn, may, may contradict what we've already decided to believe, already decided to believe. Uh, Henri Poincaré, the philosopher, said, we also know how cruel the truth often is, and we wonder whether delusion is not more consoling. Now, most people would not consider the compliment to be called delusional. But to some degree, all of us are delusional, because we believe things that at some level we've got to know aren't true, and we're deluding ourselves. So we're delusional by definition, not delusional. Now, here's another thing to look out for. False dichotomies. What does that mean? What does it mean, false Either you're with us or against. Well, no, maybe I don't give a flip about either side. The glass is half empty or it's half full. You know what I tell the head shrinkers when they ask me that? I said, no, it's half as big as it needs to be. We didn't get a lot of stuff down. Or twice as something, twice as big. You're often presented with these kinds of situations where you're told, it's this or that. And you've got to choose sides. A lot of that's crap. You don't just tell people that. But you're conditioned to say, okay, well, okay, I'm, I'm good. Yeah. So this is an interesting one because it really steps on people's toes. Well, either you're on this side or that side. Not necessarily. There's things you can take from religion that have absolutely no counterpart in science. Things that have to do to have to be a better person, a little better life, and take the things that science offers and use them in, in a manner that benefits mankind. If we spend more time doing that, we'd probably be better off. We'd probably be living up closer to the ideals that we often profess to hold because of our religious beliefs or spiritual beliefs that are not mainstream religions. You can be good without God, a friend of mine who was an atheist says, and you can be, you can. His exact quote is, you can sure as hell be bad and wrap yourself in religion. And everybody knows that's true. It's not one or the other. Science opens the door to enlightenment, closes it to dogma. Dogma is those things you're told. You believe it. That's it. Don't ask questions. And it usually has some bad consequence to keep you from asking questions. Why? Because well, many there's not an answer that they have to offer. Don't fall for the false dichotomy. Science isn't the equivalent of religion. Stephen Jay Gould, another famous scientist who's dead now, only died about 15 years or so ago, he called these non-overlapping magisteria. That's a fancy word. Basically, it says that they cover different things that speak to the human condition, and they, they don't overlap. If you, if you can find reconciliation, you can, you can you can have your, your spiritual beliefs and the scientific beliefs. That's for you to find. Beliefs are difficult to budge because people don't like, they don't act like scientists. Most people don't. Most people have an idea, have a belief, have, have something that they want to believe. And then what they're going to do is what I said before, they're going to cherry tick. They're going to make a case like an attorney would do to create a case to support their position and, and minimize any evidence that refutes it. That's not science. But it works for people in their head. They'll talk themselves into something or support something 
and feel good about it. And it's probably something they've just bought themselves into so they can feel good about it. We have a remarkable capability of doing that. <clears throat> How many of you have heard this term confirmation bias? Yeah. That's where well, I'm talking myself into things because I'm going to select the things that confirm my belief, and I'm going to reject those that don't, and I'm going to be convinced that I've got a system when I go to Vegas. It's part of the basis for why people gamble. I don't gamble much. You know why? Because I'm a scientist. I don't like to lose. They didn't build Las Vegas by giving money away to suckers. You walk in here and go, yeah, I've got a good shot at winning. No, you don't. <laughs> so I, I do play the slots once in a while just for entertainment. And as soon as I get like $50, I walk away. We often will delude ourselves, there's that word again, into believing that, oh yeah, yeah. Now, science education, who's going to be a science educator in here? Anybody? I'm not just lie to me. I want to be deluded. <laughs> Who is a science educator in here? Yeah, okay. The task I tell my faculty is a lot like being a dishwasher. Sometimes the wages seem that way, too. Here's how it works. You ever try to clean out a glass that's had milk in it? It's hard, right? You rinse it out, and then you put water in it to get it. It's cloudy. Here, once again, it's still cloudy. It's hard to get the milk out of the glass. So it's hard getting bad ideas out of people's heads. You've got to unlearn things. And kids, from the time they're really small, before they even talk, they're getting ideas about things. It's hard to get bad ideas out of their head. It's better not to get them in there in the first place. It would be more convenient if the laws of physics lined up with what we believe. But you know what? Reality doesn't care what you believe. It really doesn't. It is what it is. You can deal with it or you can delude yourself. I like this one. It's going out. Well, it could be going. I don't know what's going there. This one, can you see it? An inconvenient truth. Some of you know why that's sort of a little play there. A reassuring lie. The lines are a lot longer. Lie to me. Tell me I'm great. Tell me about that. <laughs> Cognitive dissonance, that's the situation where people get upset. It's like, oh, oh, oh these ideas, they're making me think, and I don't like it, it hurts my head. Have you ever heard people say, that, that actually hurts my head? Or uh, it makes me uneasy? Well, there's something called fMRI, and I know a couple of you know what that means, but it's functional magnetic resonance symmetry. It's where they give you some uh, tracer, and they can look in your head and see what parts are lighting up when you're thinking about certain sort of stuff. And we know certain parts of the brain do certain things, and so what they have found is they wire people up with this. We'll pretend that Jen is the subject here. So they wire her head up with this thing, they give her the tracer, then they show her things, ask her questions, and they see what part of her brain lights up. And what they find is when people are subjected to ideas that are counter, and strongly counter, to what they profess to believe in, it actually causes inside their head kind of like, <laughs> <laughs> it actually causes that sort of thing to happen. I have it sounded <laughs> So it's real. It happens. And that why? Well, when things happen in a biological system, in an organism, it's probably because we're built that way for a reason. Most of these things that we have a feel for are for who we were, not who we are. Most of our time was lived in a pre-scientific, pre-industrial, Pre-civilized mode, our survival skill set, the things that your ancestors needed to be able to do to survive so that they could be your ancestors and you could be their offspring, were different from the things we have to think about and do now. Your brains are built for the Stone Age, not the Space Age. But in the Space Age, we can say, yeah, I know, i got a Stone Age brain, and i got to work with it. Now, let me ask you another question. This is more for those of you that are jacked up on testosterone than the other half of the crowd. Although you know how that works when the roller, roller coaster of the estrogen and progesterone do that. How many of you, if somebody cut you off in traffic and you're going to kill them? <laughs> but because you're a civilized person who doesn't want to go to jail, you calm down and you say, oh, that was stupid. No, it wasn't. I really did want to kill them, but I don't want to go to jail. I have, you know, <laughs> so on and so forth. That's how, that's how close we are to the Stone Age. The civilized mind, the neocortex is usually get control of that Olympic system. The same thing is true of thinking. A lot of our thought processes are controlled and colored by emotion. 
So the things that run on the old, you know, program deep inside of our head, they sometimes influence the higher, greater thoughts. I'll kind of steal something from Lincoln, who spoke of our better angels. Our better angels are sometimes uh, coaxed into maybe doing the wrong thing by the energy. Any science fiction fans in here? Yeah. Okay. One of the greatest science fiction movies, I used to teach the course of science and science fiction, The Forbidden Planet. What destroyed the kingdom of the crowd? Monsters from the id. As sophisticated as they became, this, this fantastic civilization, the crowd, forgot the deep inside. They were once like our ancestors, mindless primitives. That's the background programming. It's like DOS running underneath Windows. Deep inside of every one of your computers, there's C dot dot slash dash. Go run in there. All right. I love this. It's a montage. How many of you guys probably name a lot of these Stephen Hawking's up there? There's a caricature of Dar uh, Darwin. Uh, this one, uh, Brian models the back, and you may not be able to see it from back there. It's a uh, take a lot, which is this is the name of the uh, amphibian that first emerged from the sea to become the uh, ancestor of most of us tetrapods. What's at stake? I mean, you guys know an existential threat is one to wipe us out. And we got a whole bunch of them. This isn't even anywhere near the whole list. I mean, we've got the possibility that a particle accelerator accident could tear up a hole in space time. And while that sounds fantastic like science fiction, it's a non-zero probability that has been demonstrated to be, well, a non-zero probability. The problem with non-zero probabilities that have very high consequences is that even if it's extremely unlikely to happen, uh, oh, if it happened, it would be very, very bad. Um, Enrico Fermi once said in the so-called Fermi Paradox, why aliens haven't been here is that as their technology advances, at some point they destroy themselves, maybe with a bomb, maybe with a particle accelerator experiment, maybe something else on this list. Could be true. Think about it. Nuclear war, ever present as an option for our destruction. Climate change, yeah. Asteroid impact, ask a dinosaur, very consequential. <laughs> Playing around with life at a molecular level, making something that really shouldn't have been made. Not some monster like on that Jurassic Park, some microbe that takes us out. Elon Musk is worried about artificial intelligence, and so am I sometimes. It isn't there yet, but can you imagine if the machines truly develop sentience and then decide what the hell do we need these things for? So how do we know, how do we know uh, what the risks are? Well, science can help us quantify it if we'll actually use it. We got a problem right here close to home. Sea level rise. A very likely scenario, this is not the upper scary end, this is the middle of the road prediction. By 2100, maybe between 2080 and 2100, we'll see a meter worth of sea level rise. You think, oh, well, there's some red there, a lot of, whoops, a lot of green still. But do you realize how much the loss this is? 10% of Florida submerged, one and a half million people displaced, 130 billion in today's dollars. <laughs> Bear with me, I've got about two minutes ago, I'm just a little, a couple ticks behind. <laughs> what science can help us with is this. It can help us assess risk. And assessing risk is math. You've got to sit down and figure out what the statistical probability of things happening are. Not everything is equally likely to happen. And remember, even things are unlikely to happen if they have high stakes attached to them, we ought to be concerned about <coughs> But people aren't so good at math, are they, Charlie? We can assess natural hazards. Remember that it isn't just the stuff we're doing. There's natural stuff that has taken a big bite out of humanity's numbers. <clears throat> About 60,000 years ago, the entire population of the world of reproductive age would have fit in about two sections across the street of Raymond James. Not filled the stadium that seats, what, about 60K? with just a couple sections. 
somewhere between 10 and 15,000 people all that survived. That's why we're so closely related. At a genetic level, any two humans are more closely related than any two non um, purebred dogs, typically. There's more diversity between non purebred dogs than there are between us and this room. So when we talk about love thy neighbor as a brother, a sister, and too far from that, I could say something, Dustin, but I'm not. <laughs> Dustin's from Arkansas. <laughs> we can also develop mitigation strategies and contingency plans. Because I'm going to tell you this, the, the horse is out of the gates on climate change. It's time now not to stop it, but to ameliorate and, and slow it and prepare for the consequences. The, the cat is out of the bag on some of this other stuff. You can't unlearn some of the things. These secrets are out. What do you do to control it? Now, that's what science can help with, but here's what science can't. And this is the human behavior side of it. And this is where science is really depending on people having a moral compass. This is where religion and other belief systems that give us guidance on morality have a very important role. <clears throat> human behavior that is problematic includes denial and rejection. And denial is, I, I'm gonna, I, I deny it. Rejection is, I may once have accepted it, but now I decide not to. Dishonesty, greed, and self-interest. That kind of goes with human behavior. And a lot of scientists actually, well, some actually espouse these bad <coughs> traits. Uh, many others are almost childlike in their naivete and fail to recognize that people may not be playing fair. In the world of business, that. There's different names for this, right? Maximizing profit. Hey, we're all interested in sales, let's be honest. Inaction. Oh, I, can't, I can't make a decision. Inaction is an action. Individually and as a society. And the last one is the one that I find the most difficult sometimes to really comprehend. How many of you are old enough to remember, if you saw it happening in real time, you'll never forget it, but everybody has seen it as a replay. I remember watching the plane hit the second tower and thinking, my goodness gracious, why did somebody do that? Deliberately, it wasn't an accident. Why do we do that? There's a possibility, I hate to tell you, it's probably higher on the list than some of these other things, that somebody or some co-conspirators in somebody will deliberately wreck the world, destroy civilization. Sociopaths are maybe up to 20% of the population according to some statistics. They do bad things like that. Science can't help us with those. Why do I have a picture of this woman dying of cancer? Why do I have that? Because we have the ability to talk ourselves out of things, into things. We have the ability to suspend disbelief. I watched my sister-in-law die of cancer, and I remember up to a couple of years before she really came down with it, uh, she was still smoking and had all kinds of excuses why she wasn't going to quit. Kept her skinny, kept her good looking, gave her some energy. But cigarettes, they also are a good example of something else. Most of the time, people, between the time smoking them and dying of some malady, it's a long enough time that they, in their mind, can put it off. Things that are much more dangerous, that can kill you real quick, we're a lot more interested in dealing with, aren't we? Well, it's lettuce in public that might kill you if you ate it. Get that out of the house. I'm throwing that away. You never heard anybody say, oh, I don't know, that romaine lettuce, I can't see any microbes on it. I'm going to go ahead and eat it. Hell, I paid $1.89 for it. See how we weigh, we weigh risks differently? Here's what I want you to take away, please. Think about this. It's a work in progress. If you want to think scientifically, it can save you money. It can save you heartache. And here's why. Because if you make better informed decisions, you're not going to do things that later you're going to say, I'm so stupid. Well, here's why. You deluded yourself. You talked yourself into it or out of it. Here's what you need to do. Question what you observe. Is that really what I'm seeing? Is that really what I'm hearing? You need to investigate further. 
you need to be skeptical. And it's okay to be a skeptic. A skeptic and a cynic are two different things. You'll become a cynic if you're not a good skeptic. You need to refute your own ideas. Ah, okay, uh, I think uh, this is where I, yeah. You need to then say, okay, I'm going to take an argument against my position to see if I can disprove myself. You need to seek out more evidence and be open-minded. And most of all, you need to think creative, creatively. You need to really stop and think, is there another solution? Is it this or that? It may be something you haven't even thought of yet. Thank you.